Section 12 of Philip Augustus by William Holden Hutton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 7, Part 2, Last Years. While in France, Saint-Denis was the great treasure house of history and the court the home of romantic legend, both glorifying Philip the Conqueror, foreign historians were little less impressed by his triumphs. From his early years, poets and chroniclers outside his own lands had watched and speculated on his career. King Philip, says Bertrand de Born, will he be like his father or follow the customs of the great Carlo? The little king of the great land, the same troubadour mockingly called him, and he declared that he has lost his rights because he is so young. But Bertrand, fickle though he was to the Angevin house, was too much of a southern knight to look with any impartial feeling on the northern king. It was different with the chroniclers of Flanders and of England. Gilbert of Mons, canon of St. Peter at Namur, chancellor of the Count Baldwin V of Eno, saw French affairs and the character of Philip with a keen but fair vision. He was the chief, if not the only, statesman who advised the rulers of Hainaut in their perilous position between the empire and the Franks. He was a faithful servant and a true patriot, a man of great parts, a traveler, a diplomatist, just as a statesman and as a historian. As early as 1184 he had negotiated the grant of the succession of Namur to Baldwin and in later years was constantly engaged in the intricate discussions and changes which eventually resulted in his masters obtaining that county. His skill, it was, that most aided Baldwin the Sixth in winning Flanders on his uncle's death. He lived to see the triumph, but he did not record the decay of the house of which he was the lifelong servant. At Mons and Namur he held ecclesiastical office, and he died perhaps at Saint-Germain at Mons, within a few months at most of Philip Augustus himself. His chronicle of Hainaut is a record of facts rather than of judgments, but it deals with facts as they appear to a statesman and a man of affairs. On King Philip he passes no direct criticism, but while he recognizes his power, he does not hesitate to accept as plausible accusations against him of treachery and fraud. Of the strength and freedom of the Flemish cities and of the discords to which they led, he gives a vivid picture, but most of all he is a faithful servant of Count Baldwin, prince most prudent and most powerful, good judge and very greatly beloved by all his men both small and great. It is good to read of Philip's acts as they appeared in the eyes of the loyal servitor of his wife's father. Gilbert of Mons was not alone among those who watched Philip from beyond his northern frontiers. Flemish analysts and historians have many a reference to the growth of his power. Especially eager was Tournay and the district round it. There Philippe Musk, clerk and chronicler, put into popular verse the alarms and excursions of the daring overlord which he had witnessed with dismay and amazement. As close was the scrutiny of the subjects of the Angevin house, Robert of Turigny, abbot of Saint-Michel, in peril of the sea, watched and recorded the beginning of that long struggle with the young Philip which should give his beloved Normandy to the Frankish king. Among many English chroniclers, who wrote of different periods of the long reign of the son of Louis the Seventh, some need special mention. Richard Fitzneil, Bishop of London and Treasurer of Henry the Second, was in possession of information as to all the alliances and the quarrels between his master and the young Philip, and Roger of Hoveden, clerk and justice, followed in the steps of his narration. Both were men who lived close to the English kings and who watched with jealous interest the rising power of their young French rival. Rarely do they turn aside from their record of fact, semi-official as indeed it is, 
to discuss motives or describe character, but in brief phrases, as well as in the detailed account which they give of Philip's movements, they show the deep interest with which the rise of his power and the development of his personality were regarded at the court of the Angevin king. Less of a courtier, but as close an observer, was Rafe di Dicetto, dean of St. Paul's. He was a personal friend of Richard Fitzneil, bishop, treasurer, and analyst. No less well known was he to William Longchamp and Walter of Coutances, the ministers of Richard and John. He is especially full in treating of the life of Philip, not only in his relations with the English kings, but in his private affairs, and chiefly his long contest with Innocent III on the divorce question. The accuracy of his information, his constant insertion of documents, and his shrewd judgments make the work of the Dean of St. Paul's of great value for the student of Philip's career. Not only at the center of public business did English writers note with surprise and in detail the growth of the power which rivaled that of their masters. Monastic chroniclers in the distant country valleys waited eagerly for information of French doings and recorded what they learnt with pious interest. The Cogshall chronicler of this period was a writer of no small ability, and his house had welcomed many a traveller who could give information, at first hand, of the doings of kings and churchmen. Anselm, King Richard's chaplain, who was with him in his romantic adventures after leaving Palestine, Milon, abbot of Pain, who heard his last confession, themselves told their experiences to the receptive ear of the Cogshall historian, and among their tales the doings of young Philip were not forgotten. Thus we find in an English monastery what is practically a first-hand authority for some of the chief acts of the French king. The historian of the priory of Augustinian canons at Newburgh, living far indeed from the great events he described, gives some of the most valuable information which we possess as to the last years of Henry the Second, the reign of Richard the First and the steady growth of the strength of the Frankish monarchy. He dwells with persistent iteration on the bitter jealousy which Philip showed during the crusade, on the venomous workings of his mind, his evil eye and galled imagination, his eagerness to defame Richard's character. Of Philip's personal history, William of Newburgh was as intimately informed he passed a severe judgment on his conduct toward Ingeborgis, and no less on the execrable perjury of two false bishops, the Bishop of Beauvais and the Bishop of Chartres, who pronounced the divorce. Yet Philip is to him still noble and most illustrious, and the French king has, it is clear, not a little of the Englishman's sympathy in his endeavors to win for himself the lands of the Angevin. William of Newburgh died probably in 1198, so that we have nothing from his hand of the triumphs of King Philip. A greater historian than these, Matthew Paris, the chronicler of St. Albans, was a diplomatist as well as a monk, and he had considerable knowledge of public affairs. But as he was probably not born before 1195, his information becomes of primary value only at the period when Philip has won Normandy and was about to triumph over the great coalition of his foes. Here he makes most important additions to our knowledge. We derive from him, better than from any other writer, a vivid impression of the English feeling which did so much to render Philip's success possible, and to which it was not altogether unwelcome. For the stormy days of Louis's invasion, there is no authority more valuable than Matthew Paris. It is not surprising that the clerks who saw the working out of those vices which brought about the fall of the Angevin should turn for contrast to the French court. In few of the English writers is there much bitter feeling against the French monarchs, but in one, a Welshman, and one who claimed to be literature as well as historian, there is an approach to deliberate and exaggerated eulogy 
of Philip the Conqueror. Gerald de Barry, Archdeacon of St. David's, had long experience of the Angevins' treachery and ingratitude. Henry II he regarded as an incarnation of the vilest vices and his sons as born to cause the destruction of their house. When he wrote his curious treatise on the instruction of princes, a book which he kept by him till old age to alter and revise, he lost no chance of praising Louis the Seventh and his son at the expense of their rivals. When he issued his final version of the work on which he had bestowed so much pains, he would dedicate it, he said, if to any one, to Louis of France, King Philip's son, because he was from his tenderest years a friend to letters, and because it is clear he regarded the failure of his English expedition with the bitterest regret. Geraldus watched the career of the great Philip with the keenest interest. From his cradle he records the visions of his fame, and he preserves little stories of the sayings and adventures of his boyhood, which show something of a personal affection and admiration for the gallant king. Most clearly of all does he show in what direction his sympathies flow by a comparison of the French with the English court, a comparison of peculiar interest. At this point, he says after speaking of the modest claim of Louis the Seventh for his beautiful realm, the land of chivalry and valor, that it had bread and wine and pleasure, at this point this seems meet to be added that in the court of the kings of France no one sees anything of mere show or of tyranny. They do not load themselves with warlike weapons in time of peace. An object of loathing to none of their subjects, they deserve to be an object of affection to all, seeing that they do not employ rods or sticks, chamberlains or attendants, to debar individuals from grievances from access to their person. At the court of France, justice is ever at hand. It is prompt and free, not put up for sale, nor made the object of that vile and accursed traffic and sin of simony. Nor, as elsewhere, is justice an attribute so priceless and divine, consubstantial and co-eternal with God himself, prostituted in that shameful way by being invariably put off from day to day with the harshness of caprice. Again, the rulers of other lands throughout their conversation make use of strange oaths, such as odds death, or eyes, or feet, or teeth, or throat, venturing on oaths as foolish as they are indiscriminate. While they show their hardihood in thus tearing the deity limb from limb, they also show that they neither fear nor revere the excellence of the divine majesty with that devotion which is its due. The kings of France, on the other hand, whenever they think fit to make use of oaths in their speech, swear by the saints of France, either under their simple names or with the addition of their titles, with the view of filling out and embellishing their conversation, and it is not in words alone, but in almost every act, that they aim at simplicity, knowing as they do that he who walketh simply walketh surely. Again, they do not behave as bears or lions in the presence of their subjects, as we have seen some rulers do. Nay, though they are exalted on the earth, they display affability and kindness toward their inferiors. Instead of being insolent and haughty, they are the rather lowly and courteous. They know and remember that they are but men, and recall the saying of the wise man, They have made thee a ruler, be not elated, but be among thy subjects as one who is of them. And that other saying, If thou art great, humble thyself in all things. Again, many a ruler have we seen who, when in the chances of war, or the hazards of fortune, he has achieved some praiseworthy success, immediately in the excess of his pride ascribes it entirely to his own right hand. But the kings of France in every instance bestow praise on the exceeding great mercy and power of heaven, and to God alone give all the thanks and glory whenever they have performed some action which has brought them thanks or earned them glory. There have been rulers, too, I and are in our days, 
who treat justice and injustice as universally equivalent, who absolutely ignore the distinctions of right and wrong, who, regarding their will as law, neither secure justice to their subjects nor preserve inviolate the troth and honor of the marriage tie, with unpardonable effrontery they disobey the dictates of honor and justice in the full light of day, setting by their sinful conduct an unholy precedent for sin. In the case of the kings of France, however, a sense of purity and honor, deserving of all praise in a ruler, preserves unsullied the sanctity of the lawful bond, while the impartiality of the scales of justice and the fairness of the methods of government, like precious jewels brought from every quarter, shed a becoming luster on the throne of the ruling sovereign. Again, I have seen rulers who, instead of succeeding to the crown in turn according to lineal descent, prefer to put the cart before the horse, and by means of the wholesale slaughter of their kinsmen, to secure for themselves a sovereignty of violence. From their excesses of bloodshed, tyranny, and cruelty, they experience, even in this world, the retribution of divine vengeance. By arrows and cross-bolts, in many a warlike encounter, and many a hostile inroad, they die unnatural deaths, and await in another world the everlasting punishment of the torments of Gehenna. Neither to their sons nor grandsons, nor yet to any other relation, do they bequeath what they have won by foul means and held by fouler. Their rule is throughout marked by unprincipled transgressions. The kings of France, on the other hand, invariably attain to their father's realm by the natural right of hereditary succession. They are in the highest degree moderate, respectful, and lenient toward their subjects. They avoid cruelty and outrage in their government. Therefore it is that in their long reigns of undisturbed prosperity, God, who even in this world sometimes bestows some recognition on good deserts, grants them from day to day increase of honor in ever fuller measure, and when at length the course of this temporal life is run, they die a blessed death, and handing on to their sons and heirs their realms in happy succession, they receive in heaven the everlasting reward of their own godly and righteous government. Again, some rulers, as a sign of high spirit, have a preference for savage and ravening beasts, such as bears, leopards, lions to be carried before them, painted on armor or embroidered on standards, they are desirous, apparently, of being likened to these creatures among their fellow men. The kings of France alone set a praiseworthy example, not only in word and gesture, but in their every act. Their one desire is to attain moderation and humility, to avoid arrogance and haughtiness. Thus it is that they mark and adorn their shields, standards, and the rest of their armor with nothing but the simple flowerets of the fleur-de-lis. It is strange, and as deserving of honorable record, as it is worthy of all praise, that in these days of ours, to anticipate a little, we have seen these simple flowers overcome the pards and the lions. These awe-inspiring beasts, so marvelous are the turns of fortune, at the first breath of these frankish flowers, turned to instant and craven flight. Without a glance behind, without another struggle, they abandoned, among the very first fruits of the war, all their caves and dens, all their wonted haunts and lairs, together with spoil untold, pastures rich and wide and studded with flowers. Then was fulfilled, as in many other cases, the gospel sentence pronounced by the infallible lips of truth itself, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted, and he that exalteth himself shall be abased. Again, in these latter days of ours, there have been rulers who, as if war had been declared, have constantly laid grasping and plundering hands on God's property. They have not permitted the bride of Christ, which he purchased for himself, and for whose welfare he shed his blood, to enjoy any freedom in their realms. 
Therefore has heaven made of them all an awful example, and brought upon them the exquisite retribution they deserved. Their own children, brought up in evil ways, have risen up in arms against their fathers from their very boyhood, and harassed them with constant and effective persecution. From the very realms in which these rulers forbade the worship of God with due rights, heaven has granted that powerful avengers of the flourishing stock of Pepin and Charles should spring, to take up the cause of vengeance and drive them forth root and branch in sorrow and disgrace. For their evil deeds they have been irrevocably driven forth, not only from this world of the dying, but from that other world of the living, not only from this world of punishment and death, but from that other world of life, not only from this world which we tread, but from that other world which we seek. Would to heaven that they had not brought this fate upon their heads. But the kings of France in their realms zealously render unto God the things which are God's, leaving to the prelates untouched and unimpaired the right of handling and dispensing ecclesiastical law, together with all their dignities and liberties. In this, as in other spheres, they receive their reward, for a rule so righteous and godly, they earn for themselves on earth great increase of honor, and in heaven, after the course of this temporal life, the imperishable meed of a triumphal crown. Deservedly, then, and by the manifest sentence of the heavenly judge is it, that the realms of tyrants so utterly wicked and perverted as those whom I have mentioned and noted above, through a divine dispensation which even in this world sometimes rewards the good and evil according to their deserts, have now, by force of arms, passed into the possession of godly and kindly rulers deserving of praise in every quarter of the globe, the rulers whose character and habits I have partially sketched. The course of events would doubtless have been the same in England as in the realm of the Franks, if England had shown to the Church that faith and loyalty, that accord and respect, which are her due, but of this enough. Whatever allowance may be made for the wounded vanity of Geraldus at the persistent ignoring of his claims to high office, which had been the studied policy of Henry II, Richard I, and John, it is clear enough that such an eulogy of the French royal house, however exaggerated, must have had some real foundation in a dignity and grandeur which impressed contemporaries. For the reason of this impression we have not far to seek. Philip was the centre of a court, which was the resort of great soldiers, great lawyers, and great priests. The poem of William de Breton shows us how close Philip lived to the familiars of his household. Guérin, the hospitaller, the bishop-elect of Saint-Lys, who fought so manfully and planned with such skill on the great day of Bouvines, was much more than a minister of the king. He was his dear friend. The language of Giraldus indeed suggests that the French kings lived in more amiable fashion with their men than did the demon race of the Angevins. Guérin certainly was in the most critical period of the reign always at the king's right hand. Philip would listen to him, even in the delicate matter of Ingeborgis, when he would hear no one else. The clerks who sate in the council, the lawyers and diplomatists who carried out his policy, formed a close circle round the king, and beside them were the young barons of the Maison du Roi, the men who saved his life at Bouvines, and whom charter after charter rewards with lands and privileges. But to the outside world, the court of the great Capetian king remained ever more or less of a mystery. The fact that for a long time there was no queen to dispense courtesies and to attract maidens and their lovers to her side in itself set a gulf between court and people. Men knew that their lord did not live an austere life, and yet he could hardly ever be called a popular king. There were days, as in his return from his great victory over the three allied powers, when his people's hearts seemed to go out to him, but on the whole 
he lived a solitary and unsympathetic life. A great king, ceaselessly active, of unwearied vigilance and ever-changing scheme, he was stern, secret, subtle, obstinate, and invincibly patient in the pursuit of what his eye desired and his hand found to do. And this character impressed itself year by year more clearly on the men of his age, so that as the days went on they became more reticent in writing of him, and the burst of springtide enthusiasm which hailed his accession died down at the end of his life into the most meagre record of his acts. The astute sovereign who began life so gallantly had become more and more of a grim enigma to his subjects. They had woven legends about his life. He had become a Charlemagne, the mysterious half-magical sovereign, rather than a gallant knight-errant of poesy and each romance took his real personality farther from his people's sight. New men arose who carried on his work without any of his own characteristics, the hot-headed gallant Louis, ever ready to break a lance or lead a forlorn hope, began with his pious domineering Spanish wife to fill a space in the popular eye from which the great conqueror had receded. Still the old king lived on, silent and self-contained, deep in schemes and very chary of action. He would not lift his hand to a romantic enterprise outside his own land. He watched and waited for results which he foresaw. And so death came to him as he quietly continued the work of consolidation and order on which he had set his heart. He passed from district to district hearing complaints, redressing wrongs, and rewarding faithful service. He bent his mind to knit the newly won provinces to the central power. Privileges overflowed to the towns of Normandy, Anjou, and Touraine. New barons were given new fiefs, and over all the king watched closely but with patience. Augustus he was called, said Rigor, because of the vast additions he had made to the royal domain. Since his accession, Vermandois, Poitou, Anjou, Touraine, Maine, Alençon, Clermont in Beauvaisis, Beaumont, Ponthieu, Artois, Amiens, Valois, and greatest of all, the Duchy of Normandy, had been added to the territory of the French crown. By purchase, by exchange, by treaty of alliance, a heritage almost as great had come into the king's hands. He might well feel that his work was done. Philip had lived a hard life. He had been on crusade. He had not spared himself in marches or in vigils by the campfire. At home he had been no more prudent than the other monarchs of his day. At fifty-eight he was already an old man. He had a son of thirty-six who had won his spurs in England and in the South. In the autumn of 1222, he began to suffer from a wasting fever, but still he worked as before. He was spared his father's sad end of impotence and decay. At Passy, in July 1223, he had summoned a council to provide against one of the small baronial outbreaks, which even the persistent vigilance of his long reign had not entirely suppressed. He felt himself sickening and gave himself into the hands of his physicians. Yet he seemed for several days to rally. He determined to go home to his new tower, the Louvre. On Tuesday, July 11th, he had felt better. On Wednesday, he was worse and received the last sacraments. But he still kept on his journey to Mantes. There, on Thursday, he rested, and on Friday the 14th, he passed away. So died Philip, the illustrious king of the Franks, writes the chronicler of Saint-Denis, a man of high prudence by nature and by art, mighty in valor, glorious in his deeds, renowned in fame, victorious in battles, who wondrously enlarged the rights and the power of the realm of the Franks, and enriched the royal treasure, for against many renowned princes, powerful in their lands, their arms, and their wealth, did he manfully contend and conquered. 
a mighty defender and protector was he also of the churches and especially the holy church of st denis did he with peculiar favour and with as it were a largesse of love nourish and guard and prove by many an effectual deed the fondness which he had toward it zealous from his early years for the christian faith in his youth he affixed the cross to his breast and warred over sea against the saracens with a strong hand and moreover when verging on old age he spared not his own son but sent him twice against the heretic albigenses with great cost and expense and both in life and in death spent largely himself in that business above all things he was most generous in giving to the poor and spreading charity in many a place they made for the great king a great burying st denis received him with all its dignity and pomp the archbishops of reims and sens were there and twenty bishops among them the pope's legate conrad bishop of porto and pandolf bishop of norwich and the faithful guerin bishop of Saint-Lys, the right hand of the dead king at the same time at two altars the requiem mass was said by the pope's legate and william of joinville archbishop of reims the tears coursed down louis's cheeks says william de breton as he followed his father's body to the tomb by him stood his half-brother philip Urepel, the legitimated offspring of the unhappy union with agnes of Meran, and john of brienne king of jerusalem there was no doubt or danger as to the succession louis had long been in possession of a separate provision and a considerable power married in twelve hundred to blanche of castile niece of king john he had received isoudon grasset and large fiefs in berry as his wife's dowry and nine years later he had been given by his father great estates in the south vermandois and artois were practically recognized as his property and as count of artois he treated separately with the flanders in twelve twelve he had long been employed by the king in important diplomatic missions and his expeditions to england to poitou and to toulouse had shown him possessed of the spirit and energy which the great conqueror looked for in his heir all men spoke well of him as a christian knight and a man of honour at his side was an intrepid and capable woman worthy to share his throne and it was already evident to guide his counsels his eldest living son was already nine years old the monarchy of philip augustus was too strong to need the support of a coronation of the heir the constantly repeated election for the benefit of the same family had become merely a formal recognition of the right of hereditary succession louis was the first of his house who was not crowned in the lifetime of his predecessor the force of routine and the strength of philip augustus had firmly established the doctrine of hereditary right the two children of agnes of meran had already been provided for within a year of the birth of philip urepel and before he had been recognized as legitimate treaties had been drawn up to establish his position he had been married when he was nine years old and knighted in twelve twenty two he was fixed in the position of a baron of the second rank his sister mary had been betrothed in twelve o two to arthur of brittany four years later she was betrothed to philip of namur whom she married in twelve ten on his death she married henry of brabant but the marriage failed to secure her father against her husband's hostility in twelve fourteen philip had left a will written in the september of twelve twenty two when he felt his sickness coming upon him he left behind him an enormous treasure which proved his careful management and his skilful treatment of the royal domain he directed that a large sum should be distributed among those from whom he had unjustly extorted a hundred and fifty thousand marks of silver he left for the succour of the holy land to the templars and hospitallers and to john of brienne his jewels he left to the monks of st denis they were bought back by his successor leaving only a golden cross which the abbey retained to his long-suffering wife ingeborgis and others and to the poor he left legacies 
and interpreting his wishes some money was given to Amari de Montfort after his death. The will, in strict feudal fashion, concerns only the treasury. The royal domain is left untouched. Philip's grandfather, Louis the Sixth, had begun the wise policy of leaving to his younger children only the position of vassals of the second rank. His example was followed by the conqueror. He left to his son, Philip Urepel, only the county of Clermont in the Beauvaisis, which he had acquired on the extinction of the Mayo line of the House of Chartres. He had already been invested with the county of Boulogne, forfeited by the traitor Reginald, whose daughter he had married. Philip, unlike many of his fathers, left no legacy of difficulties and disunion for his heir. Of the forty-three years of his reign, at least twenty-six had been years of war, and from each war the monarchy had risen stronger than before. To restore his power to the strength of that of Charles the Great, men said he had declared to be his aim. He had done as much as one man could do to accomplish the task. He had found France a small realm hedged in by mighty rivals, when he began to reign, but a very small portion of the French-speaking people had owned his sway. As suzerain, his power was derided. Even as immediate lord he was defied and set at naught. But when he died, the whole face of France was changed. The king of the Franks was undisputedly the king of by far the greater part of the land and the internal strength of his government had advanced as rapidly and as securely as the external power. Philip Augustus was the first of his race who could reign, if he willed, as a despot. In conquering the Angevins, he had succeeded to something of the characteristics of their government. The master of Rouen and of Angers was a different man from the mere lord of Paris and Orléans. The march of the monarchy under Philip the Conqueror, by changing the face of France, changed the history of Europe. It placed a new power among the great states, which should henceforth exercise a commanding influence. It had been Philip's task to found France, in the sense in which we now use the word. Under him, the king of the Franks is first clearly seen to be sovereign of Gaul. Great as a conqueror, he was even greater in constructive and unifying power. What he found, he consolidated, and what he founded, he laid firm. In a century of great men, beside Innocent III and Frederick I and Henry II and Saint Bernard, he stands with the greatest. In his work and in himself, he is worthy to take place among the great statesmen who have made the Europe of today. End of chapter 7, part 2 Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California in May 2016 End of Philip Augustus by William Holden Hutton